Um, my name is Tom O'Brien. I'm the executive director of the Center for International Trade and Transportation here at Long Beach State. Uh, I'm off. Yeah, go Beach. Uh, I'm also the Associate Director for Long Beach Programs of the Metrans Transportation Center. Uh, Metrans is a university transportation center partnership between uh, Long Beach and the University of Southern California, which, as you will hear in a bit, is celebrating its 20th anniversary this year. So happy anniversary to Metrans. Um, on behalf of um, Dean Jeet Joshi, uh, who's also AVP for Internet International Education here at Long Beach, and Associate Dean Timothy Mozia. I am pleased to welcome you to our campus and to the 18th CITT State of the Trade and Transportation Industry Town Hall meeting. Since our first town hall in 1999, our goal has been to provide a forum in which we can explore a key issue challenging the goods movement industry and the many stakeholders who are in some way connected to that industry. We strive to address these issues of common concern and interest in a respectful way and in the spirit of education. This year's theme is the Clean Air Action Plan 3.0, balancing benefits and costs. The relationship uh, between goods movement and the environment is a topic we've had occasion to visit numerous times in this town hall forum. And the next generation of the plan, adopted by the two ports in the fall of 2017, is certainly a topic on the minds uh, of the industry, the community, and the regulatory agencies, which is why I assume we have the interest of all of you who chose to come tonight. Um, one person who's consistently demonstrated an interest in the work that we do um, and the relationship between the university and the ports uh, is my dean, Dr. G. Joshi, and I'd like to welcome him to the podium right now to say a few words of welcome. Good evening. So, those of you who are looking at the agenda, you probably guessed that I'm not President Connolly. Uh, President Connolly was so much looking forward to being here tonight, uh, but C is under the weather. So I get the honor to welcome you know, all of you. Uh, President Connolly has been a staunch supporter of industry-university partnerships, and she has taken a uh, real interest in the work of CITT and what Tom does and his team. And recently she has really talked with me in terms of our role in the community and the industry in terms of creating a real partnership. So President Connolly uh, is here you know, in her uh, thoughts, but uh, certainly she couldn't be uh, here tonight. The CITT Town Hall has been an institution of this campus for close to 20 years. Uh, started in 1998, and Marianne was sharing with me her memories of the first town hall. Uh, the town hall has provided a unique forum uh, for the industry, including labor, the community, and the university to come together in the spirit of education to address issues of common concern. This year's topic, the next generation of the San Pedro Bay's Ports Clean Air Action Plan provides another opportunity for the university to demonstrate its unique ability to convene a large university to demonstrate its unique ability to uh, a large gathering of rather large gathering of stakeholders with an interest in securing the health and well-being of both our community and our vitality, uh, important trade and transportation center, uh, sector. It, it also gives us an opportunity to showcase the talents of the College of Continuing and Professional Education's various departments, especially the advanced media production team, which has once again produced a very informative video to introduce tonight's discussion. The advanced media production, AMP, we call it, has won numerous awards for this work, for its work, including the town hall videos in the past, and this year's is of similarly high quality video. This year is also special because, as Tom mentioned, marks the 20th anniversary of the 
Metrans Transportation Center, a partnership program of Cal State Long Beach and University of Southern California that has survived the vagaries of the university transportation grant cycle. Sometime you know, sometime you don't. That's what the grant cycle is. And it has become a nationally recognized and well-respected home to research, education, and outreach in the areas of transportation in general, but freight in particular. Metrans draws upon the strength of its public and private university partners to contribute to our transportation knowledge base and to help develop a well-educated workforce. Metrans provides critical financial support for this event and has done so for many years, from the very beginning to be specific. Most recently, Metrans has, was awarded the Reason 9 University Transportation Center by the USDOT and its partnership has grown uh, to include University of California Davis, University of California Irvine, UCLA, University of Hawaii, Northern Arizona University, and Pima Community College in Tucson. Uh, some of the uh, representatives from these institutions are here, and I welcome them. The Pacific Southwest Region UTC held its first Congress, you know, that's why they're here, uh, here on campus today, prior to the town hall. Uh, we also want to welcome our various other partners from industry and the community. These include our friends from the Port of Long Beach, Academy of Long Beach, Academy, Port of Long Beach Academy of Global Logistics at Carrillo High School. The university and CITT are thrilled to be part of this exciting effort to develop career pathways in logistics right here in Long Beach. It starts right at high school. The university and CITT are, um, you know, starting this, you know, partnership with, in partnership with the Long Beach Unified School District. I also want to recognize the members here from the ILWU, which has been part of the town hall since its inception. Last year, the first Dominic Miretti Award was given at the town hall in honor of Union's liaison to the ports. I am quite excited that CITT's founding executive director, my colleague and friend, Marianne Gestelum, is being recognized tonight with this honor. Once again, welcome everybody. Thank you, Gene. Um, and thank you, as always, for your support of CITT on everything we do. Um, we've always enjoyed, as, as uh, Dr. Joshi said, strong partnerships with so many in this room. Um, and in addition to the ones that he mentioned, I would like to call out a few. Um, we exist first and foremost because of our students, and I'd like to welcome the students, graduates, and instructors from the Global Logistics Specialist, Marine Terminal Operations Professionals, and Master of Science in Supply Chain program. Many thanks to you all, to the students, and a big thank you to our dedicated instructors and professors. Thank you. I'd also like to recognize the members of the CITT Policy and Steering Committee. Their names are listed on the program, um, and please help me recognize them and thank them for making this night possible. Uh, they represent all segments of our industry and our community, and we couldn't do what we do at CITT without their assistance. So thank you to the Policy and Steering Committee. Um, and well, I'd like to consider all of you dignitaries. Um, there are a couple that I would like to call out in particular and thank them for being here. Um, we have Mario Cordero, the Executive Director of the Port of Long Beach, and Bonnie Lowenthal, a Harbor Commissioner, Port of Long Beach. Yeah. Uh, Sarah Patterson from Assemblymember Patrick O'Donnell's office. Thank you. Yeah. And I think it is a first for us. Uh, we have a representative from the Polish Trade and Investment Agency, Karolina Zatorska. Thank you for joining us. 
As Jeep mentioned, we have um, uh, significant ILWU representation here tonight, so thank you very much. Um, I'd like to recognize in particular uh, Mike Ponce, the uh, Local 63 Vice President. <laughs> G Gary Herrera, Vice President for Local 13. And Rudy Alba Sr., Vice President for Local 94. And I'd like to uh, offer my special thanks to David Serrato, the, the ILWU's liaison to the ports, who uh, helped us in getting the word out and, and uh, making sure we had good representation here. So thank you, David. <laughs> my apologies if I missed uh, someone. Um, I'd also like to thank our sponsors who make sure we can keep this event free of charge and open to the public. Uh, these include our principal funders for all Metrans projects, the U.S. Department of Transportation and Caltrans, and our Town Hall uh, 2018 sponsors, Watson Land Company, the Alameda Corridor Transportation Authority, the L.A. County uh, Customs Brokers and Freight Forwarders Association, and the ILWU. Thank you. And then our Metrans Associates. The Associates program provides the core support for Metrans. Um, as you all know, we cannot survive on grant funding alone, as, as uh, Dr. Joshi suggested. And, and so we truly appreciate the support of all of our Associates members. Um, and those Associates members are the Port of Los Angeles, the Port of Long Beach, Nixon Peabody, the Southern California Association of Governments, LA Metro, Cirrus YTI, Majestic Realty, Metrolink, and Nancy Voorhees for the Allen M. and Natalie P. Voorhees Fund. So thank you all for your continual support on an annual basis. You make this possible. Um, uh, Dean Joshi mentioned the Metrans 20th anniversary. Um, and for the majority of that time, uh, the center has been led by Dr. Jen Giuliano. Under her leadership, our two universities have gained um, not just a national, but an international prominence in, in research, education, and training. This town, hall, this town hall has extended its reach beyond Long Beach because of our affiliation with Metrans. So Jen, thank you for your support of all we do here on this campus and for giving us such a great platform to share what we do. So there, there's a save the date card that you uh, received in your program when you checked in, and we hope you'll join us on the evening of October 4th for a special 20 year anniversary celebration. So, and now, on to the town hall and our discussion of the Clean Air Action Plan. Um, as always, we begin with the video produced by Dave Kelly and his team at AMP within CCPE. Yeah. I know, you haven't, you haven't seen it yet, but you'll, yeah. You haven't seen it yet, but the applause is worth it. It's, it's warranted. Um, Dave had this year the challenge of taking what is a very complex and often confusing topic, the development of a joint port environmental policy, and distilled it into a very informative 15-minute video that will tell the story of how we got to where we are today. We'll then move on to our panel discussion. We know that there have been a lot of forums out there discussing CAP, which is a good thing. Uh, but it's why we thought we would take an outside the gate and an outside the region perspective and provide a forum for a unique set of voices. Your, moder jo your moderator, Jolene Hayes from Fair and Peers, um, who has a number of years of experience in the private sector and uh, with the port, will lead a discussion that includes uh, the perspectives of the regulatory community, an OEM, an energy expert, a BCO, and uh, a ports and terminals uh, uh, expert who can share how competitor ports view the actions taken here in Southern California. And as you heard, at the end of the evening, we'll confer the Dominic Moretti Award um, in our second year to CITT's founding executive director, Marianne Gastelum. The format and guidelines for the public Q&A portion are included in your program. Please keep questions to the point and on topic. Um, no multiple part questions, and we ask that you're careful to keep it to questions instead of commentary. Um, and you can ask questions by submitting a, uh, a card to one of the ushers, um, raising your hand, and we, can, uh, uh, and we can take a question from the floor. Now, please uh, enjoy the video.
Attention grabbing, extreme weather related incidents, and global concerns about air pollution, rising tides, warming seas, extended droughts, wildfires, and massive flooding have motivated California state government to pass legislation with very stringent carbon emission reductions requirements. These restrictions, coupled with the regulatory authority and oversight of the California Air Resources Board, known as CARB, are weighing heavily on cargo and freight transportation industries. CARB is proposing that all cargo handling equipment in seaports and rail yards begin utilizing zero emission equipment in year 2026, with 100% compliance required for all yard equipment by 2031. By comparison, other California industries will have until year 2050 to reduce their emissions to 80% below 1990 levels. The California goods movement industry today finds itself in the crosshairs of a sharply focused and ambitiously determined effort to protect the environment and achieve zero emissions. This effort and its ripple effects come at a time when the Southern California logistics industry faces renewed, revitalized, and growing competition from East Coast ports and a gradual Western shift in the geographic centers of manufacturing in the supply chain. Market share percentages and the associated jobs and economic activity are at stake as the local industry and ports adjust, evolve, and scramble to meet the new requirements. So with the advent of the widening of the Panama Canal, uh, raising of, of uh, the bridge in New York, other infrastructure improvements, these shippers will take a look at that and say, hey, we have other options now. Uh, so it's, I don't think it's anything that, that the West Coast has not done specifically to keep up with the competitiveness. Uh, it's more opportunities that the beneficial cargo owners see that has created a little bit of the shift of market share from West Coast to East Coast and Gulf Coast ports. Uh, it all depends on reliability. Um, the shippers want to get their goods uh, to their customers as efficiently as possible, and they have many more options today than they may have 10, 12, 15 years ago. Fortunately for the region, the San Pedro Bay ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach have been reducing emissions steadily in the harbor since the first pioneering Clean Air Action Plan, known as CAP, was adopted in 2006. The environmentally friendly, comprehensive set of emission reduction programs implemented by CAP partnered industry with government and the community to achieve a dramatic reduction of diesel particulate matter by 87% in the last 12 years. The Clean Air Action Plan is now entering its third iteration, with the latest updated version adopted by both ports in November of 2017. By progressively addressing emissions concerns, the current CAP will pursue compliance with CARB's requirements and contribute substantially to the state's overall efforts to reduce greenhouse gases. The new Clean Air Action Plan update was an incredibly collaborative effort by many stakeholders and builds on our port's environmental achievements over the last decade. The new CAP sets the bar high, but the Port of Los Angeles is committed to leading the way. We believe that economic growth and environmental stewardship can be mutual goals. Over the past two years, our port has broken records for cargo growth while reducing emissions by as much as 40% per container. The plan will help accelerate the use, commercial viability, and demand for next generation near zero and zero emission technology. I'm very proud that the Port of Los Angeles is considered a model for sustainability and is the cleanest gateway in the world. We look forward to continuing this trend. Well, the core value for the Port of Long Beach is to have, as I indicated, a sustainable model in terms of how we conduct our business. That model includes your social corporate responsibility. So as the core of that objective to reduce emissions, and now of course in the 2017 version of the Cleaner Action Plan, to eliminate emissions, not just reduce them, eliminate. I think that moves forward with the way our thought process has been here, going back to the Greenport policy, which is to make sure that we grow green. And in this particular case, we're actually going to get to a point where there will be no emissions with regard to whether as a result of transportation uh, related, like for example, trucks and or cargo handling equipment. So those are worthy goals. And again, that's right in line with our mission statement in terms of being the green port of the future. 
Without question, the 2017 version of the Clean Air Action Plan will require some heavy lifting, substantial expense, and faith that new technologies will emerge in time to meet the new goals and deadlines. Specifically, the goals state that 100% of off-road yard handling equipment operating in the harbor will be tailpipe emission-free by the year 2030. At present, the technology does not exist to facilitate these new standards. Marine terminals will be hampered and face delays in fulfilling zero-emission policies until such technology is developed, tested, and implemented. The ports have set a goal for on-road vehicles, including semi-trucks, to generate zero tailpipe emissions by 2035. Interim benchmark goals for ultra-low or near-zero emissions from trucks and yard equipment are set to begin with incentives as early as 2019 or 2020. The initial Clean Air Action Plan in 2006 involved implementing new technologies along with adopting effective new policies, such as reducing vessel speeds for ships approaching the harbor and establishing use of low sulfur fuels. These adjustments achieved the goals of greening the harbor and cleaning the air. As time progressed, more efficient diesel truck engines manufactured with the newest 2007 EPA-rated engines allowed newer drayage trucks to replace older, more polluting vehicles through the partially grant-funded Clean Truck Program. Simultaneously, natural gas vehicles in the terminal yards and the beginnings of onshore powering for idling ships helped bring down air pollution significantly. Altogether, harbor improvements reduced overall particulate matter by more than 85 percent, nitrous oxides by more than 50 percent, and sulfur oxides by more than 95 percent. Now that older truck engines manufactured prior to 2007 have disappeared from the harbor, the next wave of Trek technology must step forward. All eyes are upon an industry where experts say technology may be at least two leaps away from manufacturing reliable, zero-emission, heavy-duty trucks that can operate for 400 miles or more on one battery charge. Current battery technology in the prototype phase for semi-trucks can operate only for a maximum distance of 100 miles. According to media reports, various truck manufacturers are competing to build ultra-low emission vehicles through hybridization and fuel cell applications. Mack Trucks, Daimler, Cummins, Volvo, and other companies are working on near-zero hybrids, fuel cells, and or all electrical trucks. Tesla is making a public relations splash with its prototype all-electric truck with driverless options. Natural gas-powered vehicles already satisfy the ultra-low emission standards for heavy trucks and may provide an interim bridge until battery power is sufficient to provide the 400-mile range desired while meeting the port's ultimate goal of zero tailpipe emissions. We've identified a few of the solutions, right? So the, the zero electric, the natural gas engines, the hydrogen fuel cells, those exist and there's a lot more technology improvements that can be done but there's really a question, is there going to be a, uh, a new battery technology that really is a, a revolution as opposed to the evolutionary uh, improvements? And so um, that we don't know. And, and I think if we had that big jump in, say, energy density for a battery, then we would see quite a bit of uh, um, help in, in terms of that long haul issue. In the marine terminals, every piece of moving equipment from gantry cranes to top loaders to hostlers must operate at zero emission capability by 2030. Some terminals are testing the latest battery-powered yard equipment and the automated Middle Harbor facility is using battery-powered vehicles. However, technology has not been developed or tested which would fully transition operations in a conventional, non-automated yard. Alternative fuel vehicles, including natural gas-powered equipment, have been operating as ultra-low emission options for about a decade on a smaller scale. Container and cruise ships will be required to connect to electrical sources at the dock through a process known as cold ironing, or alternative marine powering. The twin ports of the San Pedro Bay recognize that the future in a zero-emissions environment will mean that more electrical power needs to be supplied to the harbor. Yard vehicles and ships will require recharging and direct connection capability. 
A substantial degree of energy management planning is occurring at both ports, from an energy initiative in the San Pedro Bay to an energy management action plan to assure greater energy supplies will be coming in the future from sustainable sources. The cost of retrofitting marine terminals, adding new infrastructure elements, and replacing the current trucking fleet to meet zero emission standards is estimated to be somewhere between seven to 14 billion dollars. The question of who will pay for all of the upgrades usually results in discussions about grants, increased leasing charges for marine terminals, and even possible fees on trucks. It remains an open question as to how much elasticity is left for discretionary cargo before the elastic band is broken and larger percentages of containers start moving to other points of entry. The San Pedro Bay has lost about 3 to 4 percent of market share to East Coast and Gulfport competition in the last few years. Beneficial cargo owners will have an important voice regarding strategic goods movement planning and likely would opt to either reroute some discretionary cargo or pass along some of the new costs to clients and customers down the line. This potential impact of the cap and carb requirements will have bearing on striking the balance between competitiveness and rapidly reduced emissions. Well, I know that the BCOs are very, very nervous about what the cost implications are for this. Um, we all see this as a, a tidal wave of cost coming at us. Maybe tidal wave isn't, isn't the right word, but a wave of, of additional costs that are just going to make it more and more difficult, more expensive to bring cargo into this port. So you'll have some BCOs that, as I said earlier, um, will divert cargo to other ports in, in the goal of reducing their costs. Uh, and you'll have some of the, the uh, BCOs here in the state that are forced to accept this. But what you will see is an inevitable uh, transfer of these costs to the consumer. Port authorities are actively pursuing an increase in the percentage of containers that load directly onto rail to reduce truck trips within and near the harbor area. To allow for anticipated cargo growth in the future, the plan is to transfer as much as 50% of containers from ships directly to rail for the long haul trip to the Midwest and possibly to an offshore inland rail hub in Southern California for redistribution via local trucks. Because goods movement, trade, and the logistics industry account for about one of every nine jobs in the Southern California region, any change in the current arrangements could have an impact on the area's employment status and the resulting economic prospects. Mindful of this nexus, a separate but related strategic planning effort is titled the California Sustainable Freight Action Plan. That action plan takes into account the variables involving population growth, community impact, and the need to steward the goods movement industry in ways that sustain vitality without damaging the environment. The Sustainable Freight Action Plan considers new technologies and updated logistics planning methods which streamline the throughput of cargo containers. These methods enable efficiencies in a redesigned and modernized appointment system to overcome and control congestion and wasted time. We can figure things out. Uh, we've proven that over and over again. We've proven that we're resilient. And I think the thing that is really encouraging to me is all the relationships that have been formed, um, all of the folks that are talking to each other. Um, we were all guilty, and you all have heard me say this over the years, we all stayed in our own silo. You know, if you were in commercial real estate, you kind of knew your, your business. If you were at the ports, you kind of knew your business. And when the Tidelands Trust border was there, you just said, okay, you know, We've done our jobs, and I think all of us, we've gotten to know each other. We've tried to understand the other's business model. So I think we've made tremendous strides. I think we lose sight of that. We kind of forget how far we've come. The residents of the areas most affected by goods movement can take laudable credit for the end results of greener ports and cleaner air. Active voices and concerns expressed through legislators and litigation have contributed to the ongoing developments in environmental mitigation. Various proactive solutions have improved the human health prospects in harbor area communities. 
the Clean Air Action Plan provides an opportunity for the local ports and the harbor industry to continue with direct action the rapid progress made in the past dozen years. Already perceived as a model of environmental consideration in the global trade sphere, the San Pedro Bay's solutions in the near future, in the next dozen years, will set the standard for other harbor logistics industries worldwide facing similar challenges. Although the immediate road ahead will have its costs, setbacks, and uncertainties, achieving the goal of zero emissions in a thriving harbor community will resonate through improved quality of life and ongoing economic opportunity if balanced carefully. And best of all, this will occur while greatly pleasing Mother Nature. Fantastic video, which sets the stage, clearly raises a lot more questions than we have answers, but that's the job of the panel. So at this point, I'd like to invite uh, Jolene and the, the panelists to come up, and uh, we'll have our discussion and open the town hall. Remind you that all of the bios are in, the, uh, are in your program. Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? I have not the biggest voice, so if you start to not hear me, just raise a hand and I will try to make sure I'm speaking into the microphone. Now, I had a lot of things I, I thought about saying and introducing this topic with, but I think the video pretty much summed up all of my thoughts on this. Um, many of us have been around since the beginning of the Clean Air Action Plan and the Greenport policy, which really kicked off around 2004. When before then, before that time, we weren't really a known thing. The port just did its own thing. And then all of a sudden, we started realizing that we were impacting the environment. So there's been a lot of transformation in a, lot, in, in a very short period of time. And I know there are some of you in the room that also work outside of California. And some of the panelists, I think we'll, we'll hear some interesting perspectives from them. But... Um, I think initially all of us were concerned with the elasticity issue. How much cargo could we potentially lose from the very first Greenport policy and the Clean Air Action Plan? Um, what amount of, of business were we going to lose to East Coast or Gulf Coast ports? And I think what's happened over the years, um, I mean, there were even some campaigns that we saw on the East Coast saying, come here, we're cheaper. You can get through our gateways much easier. And what's happened is they've come under the same pressure that our our ports have come under. Their communities want cleaner environments. So the clean truck programs have hit the East Coast as well. And I think that that's one thing, even with this Clean Air Action Plan doing some unprecedented um, things, which I, I have some questions for the panel later, but um, in driving the charge to move technology that isn't quite there yet, I, I, don't, I don't know if that's necessarily a, a, as scary as some of us might think. But just to start out the discussion tonight, um, we have a number of panelists. Um, you've, I don't know if you've had a chance to look at their bios because we were handed these on the way in. So I'm going to briefly go through um, the people that we have with us this evening. On the far end, we have Philip Davies. Um, he's a principal with Davies Transportation Consulting. So a lot of what he does is Econo he, he's on the drainage side of things, so supply chain and how it impacts his business is, are some of the questions that you'll be able to ask of him outside of California and what he sees as um, some potential challenges that, that this, these new regulations bring here. And then next to him, I believe we have Arvin with Volvo. 
So Arvind and I have had the opportunity to work together on a couple of new technological advancements, such as truck platooning, and he's also been involved in the demonstration project that's on Alameda Street with the overhead catenary truck. So a lot of what he's been engaged in is trying to come up with that zero emission truck that we've all been waiting for. He'll tell us how far off it is. And then let's see, Judy Mitchell. So we are pleased to have Judy Mitchell on the panel, who is um, not only on the California Air Resource Board, but she's also a South Coast Air Quality Management District Board member and um, is, the, I think, currently the pro tem, mayor pro tem of Rolling Hills Estates. So Judy has the perspective of our local communities as, as well as um, how these regulations came to be. And then next to Judy. <laughs> I couldn't see you. <laughs> so next to Judy, we have Norbert Orr. And um, Norbert is also involved in some of the supply chain um, BCO issues. So he'll be able to talk about how, how he's been hearing from the industry. And then last but not least is Donald Paul with the USC Energy Institute. So um, Donald, has, he previously was with Chevron Corporation for several years working on the, on the energy side from, from that perspective. So he'll be able to talk about what kind of infrastructure is required to power this new generation of vehicles. So let's see that. I will introduce Philip Davies. Or am I introducing it? I guess we're just asking questions, so my bad. Because initially we had, we had a conversation about what each of us does, and that was really helpful for me. But I think I'll start out with just a couple of questions of my own. I know one of the things that, that struck me was the technology. Some of the technology isn't quite there yet, but we have regulations saying that these, these have to be implemented by a drop dead date. So I, I'm curious from the panelists, um, how are we going to get there? And what are your perspectives from either as an OEM perspective of developing these technologies or what the BCOs and the supply chain thinks about trying to comply with those regulations. <laughs> Don't all jump at once. <laughs> Did we start about the vehicles? I mean, yeah, that's the natural place to start. Yep. Uh Good evening, everybody. I'll try to make it quick and painless and interesting, right? Uh, so I think the good news here, uh, and it's really important to walk away with this, is innovation is coming. It's for the betterment of what we do. It's, it's coming no matter what. It's what we choose to do with it, uh, really. So, so there's technology development happening. Uh, I, I, I'm wearing the, the, the Volvo Group hat today, but then there's my, my competitors and then other technology developers working on similar things trying to make the operations safer, better, efficient. So with all these things coming, the one thing that I want to leave you with is, uh, I mean, I can ramble on and on about the cool things we're working on, everybody, each of us, uh, the technologists. But I think it's not something that the technologist alone is going to be able to solve. As you saw from the video, one of the things that really struck me was Fran's comment toward the end. Everybody still works in silos. So here you go. You talk about technology, and then, of course, there's the technology developer. But what we're trying to do here is to develop the technology, keeping the customer in mind, keeping the other components, other players of the supply chain in mind, because eventually we want to make sure that this technology is useful. Uh. You know, I would add, it's, you know, this is an opportunity, uh, given the, the amount of emphasis that's going to be placed on this. It's not a local or a regional issue. It, it's a national, it's an international issue. So uh, the resources are going to be directed toward how do we do this? How do we get past either how do we come up with a generation of lithium ion batteries, et cetera, that uh, are very, very significant improvement, or whatever the next generation is. but. 
it's certainly in the mainstream of the needs of science and what science can do to, to help the environment and, uh, and, and the, the, the transportation. I think one of the questions, and you hinted it, is that if we were to convert, even tomorrow, well, if you can't do it, but let's assume tomorrow you converted to an all-electric infrastructure, displacing natural gas and diesel fuel, where would the power come from? And it's a significant amount of power. Uh, so if one looks at the overall power grid for Southern California, it's already stressed as we've been switching out away from baseload power to renewable power and others. And you're going to have to import most of it from somewhere. You're not likely to build, in my view, you're not likely to build a major power plant in the middle of Long Beach. So, so I understood, let me ask you this question, because I understood from readings in the last moment, months or so that we are actually selling some of the solar renewable power, power across state lines because we can't absorb it. Is at this, certain times. Is this true? <laughs> yeah, at certain times, but we still import basically, and we import 90% of the natural gas that we use into California. <clears throat> so. Well, what I will say. So I think I just think yeah. I think it is a major shakeup in the power system, yeah. and the distribution of power, and okay. and um, so I think that's a, a key element. It's not that potentially power can't be made up somewhere, but it would be a it would be a material new load to the Southern California power grid if you were to displace all the fuel used by all the trucks. And there are efforts in the legislature now to put in legislation that will take us to 100% renewable right. power and, by and 2050, I believe. We don't have somebody from one of the power utilities, which would have, <laughs> yeah. have an interesting comment about them. how one would do that. So I, I think that the key message is, not that you have the answer, but when you introduce a new technology into the system, it has other effects. There are other infrastructures that are going to have to get adjusted. And I guess the one comment I have about it is for energy infrastructures, 10 years is no time. I mean, that's virtually tomorrow. So I think that that's one of the other issues. I think the big issue may not be the technology. I think it may be the time stress to do the displacement. And the other aspect of that, of course, are the fleet owners. What are they supposed to do, right? What did they do? Maybe they just ship their trucks to Texas and then everything's okay, but that doesn't change the overall emissions balance very much. So <clears> one <throat> of the things that that regulation does is it attempts to be technology forcing. And, and it is technology forcing. But at the same time, I will say as a regulator, that I recognize that sometimes we can't get where we aim to go. And uh, certainly regulators go back and look at the timeline, the goal again, and they make adjustments. Um, you will see that what uh, Air Resources Board had on its agenda a year ago got adjusted just last week and pushed out a little further. So there is this going on all the time. Um, and as regulators, uh, what we try to do, and we're required to do actually under the, under the Clean Air Act, is we're required to move the environment forward to meet the requirements of the federal, federal Clean Air Act. But we're also required to look at the economy and not injure the economy. So we're constantly doing this kind of balancing act, and that means is the, regu is the regulation forcing some new technology to get us to the environmental goal? And at the same time, what is that regulation doing to our economy, mm -hmm. and do we need to make adjustments? So kind of on the, that playing field is, is where, we, where we sit. Well, I'm speaking from someone in a smaller center, I mean, we certainly look to California which has this massive market and can, in fact, fund and push these technological advancements um, uh, and, and do the research and development that would not be 
possible, you know, for a smaller center. Uh, and, you know, if, if Vancouver decided that they were going to have zero emissions trucks uh, and, and uh, California decided they weren't, uh, the industry wouldn't be gearing up to, to, to provide the technology. But, you know, I think it's very important, though. I mean, there are obviously technical issues about the viability of the technology, but there are also uh, sort of social issues. And, and I think one of the examples here is the, the clean trucks program. When, uh, you know, when the clean trucks program was initiated, there were, there were studies that were done by Metrans, that were done by the ports, which clearly showed that the truck drivers could not afford to buy new trucks. And in fact, 80% of the time owned their own trucks, mm -hmm. but you know, they were 12 years old, they were grossly polluting yeah. vehicles. So, you know, what happened is that the, the industry developed a lease to own model for the truck drivers. Right. So those who have uh, gone through the course of that are now probably at the state where they have been paying their le the high lease payments for 10 years. Uh, and maybe now are back to the point where they were in 2007 of owning their own truck. And in two or three years, it's going to be obsolete. Mm. Uh, you know, is, is that cycle going to be repeated? Mm -hmm. And as I say, I don't have enough information to say exactly what happened to the driver's earnings, whether the rates went up high enough so they got more money or less money, or where the money went. Right. I mean, it would be easy enough to find that out. Uh, but I think it needs some leadership uh, to, to do that. And there was some leadership, at least in looking at those issues, prior to the Clean Trucks program. So I think it would, it would be, it would be responsible to do that again. And, and so one of the things that California does is we provide incentive money for the new technology. And you probably all know about the Carl Moyer program. It's available, it's incentive money available to the truck owner who goes a step further than what the regulation requires. So for example, low knox trucks, which are that 11.9 liter truck is being certified now, will be on the streets in the near future, and incentive money would be available to the truck fleet owner for that. One of the things that we do have here, particularly in our ports, is we have a lot of uh, fleet owners that own small fleets, between one and three fleets, and it's hardest for them. So I want to say that they're always in the back of my mind. How do we help them? The larger fleet owners have the capacity, the economic capacity in most cases, to turn their fleet over and they can do it in phases and increments to, to, to manage it. But I do worry about that small uh, fleet owner who um, is right. struggling. So one of the things we said when we passed our air quality management plan a year ago was we have to provide incentive money to get over the goal line. And we anticipated we would need a billion dollars a year. And where is that money going to come from? So we're working on that. But the ports are working on it too. So I heard in your video, it's going to cost between seven billion and $14 billion to reach our goals. That is actually matches up with what uh, the South Coast Air District thinks as well. So. Um, we'll, we, we need to work on this together. I think collaboration is the key to doing, mm -hmm. doing all of these things. And I visited Volvo uh -huh. last October. Yes, yes. And um, the, a lot of interesting things are happening in Europe, but Volvo had a very nice electric bus that I took a ride on, and it pulled into a station. The um, charger, bar came down from the roof of that station. It was a little coffee shop. And the bus gets charged up in about 10 minutes. And that was the end of the line. So people got off. Uh, they could go where they wanted to go. People wanted to get on. We're in the coffee shop, could come out. There was a, little, a campus there for a, um, a, a college. This was in Gothenburg. Yep. So the one thing that I would like to add on to this is what Judy didn't tell is there were 19 other people who were involved in that project. So there were about 20 stakeholders, different stakeholders, one OEM, Volvo, but there were 19 other very important stakeholders who made this happen. And now it's been operational for over a year. It's sustainable. 
it's not only sustainable from the environmental perspective, it's also making us money, it's making the, the bus operator money, it's, it's saving people, providing mobility at affordable costs. So that's where the sustainability comes in and you need a lot of people to come together. It takes a whole village to build a sustainable transportation infrastructure system. So. You know, yeah. The other people involved were your transportation. Exactly, uh, the, the transportation. local bus operator, and then there was the university component. Uh, there were people who were actually installing the uh, electric cantilevers, uh, and then there were people who were retrofitting the bus stations with some added technology. So all kinds of people, all kinds of people. No, I think maybe another, a new question. Because there, <laughs> there are a lot question. of, we had some vigorous discussion when we had our pre-conference call. We did. <laughs> yeah, all this is rehearsed. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Oh, really? <laughs> I wasn't on the call. <laughs> I, I think one of, one of the questions that came up was um, the pressure on the industry and how this is affecting all of, the, all of the components within the supply chain, whether it's the BCOs, we've talked about the truckers, but what about the marine terminal operators? and the warehouses and all of the other aspects and players within the supply chain, what does that mean for California? Are they going to leave? We think one of the things that came up that was discussed, there are factors that are not in California's control. And uh, one is how is the supply and logistical system in the United States changing as a result of increased domestic manufacturing potentially reduced imports, and alternate transportation fairways with the widening of the Panama Canal. Those are forces that the port doesn't have. And one of the questions that came up is, how resilient is the port to a fundamental shift in the markets? And that's a good question, because, well, we did hear on the video that Four percent or so of the traffic has been gone. diverted to East Coast ports. Yeah. So, yeah, how how are the ports preparing for that? Of course, your emissions are going to go down because you don't have as much traffic. So there's the good side. Well, they go up, the but bats. they go up somewhere else. Well, they do. Yes, and, they do. And, and I think that's that's a. But but the realignment of the supply chains in the United States, which is underway with this manufacturing renaissance in the Midwest and southeast primarily. Mm -hmm. Yeah, California is no longer really in the large-scale manufacturing that's business. Right. Right. So I think that's a basic question. I don't know the answer to that. But if the U.S. is going to produce import less, that's a, that's a, really, that's a shift for everybody's ports. And, and what, you know, maybe our economists can really say, what, what, is that, what would a 5% drop in imports do? Well, obviously, it'd have effect, uh, significant effects, but you had more than that, I think, during the Great Recession, um, and you, you, you saw what the effects are. Now, I don't think the, what we're That's seeing true. is any sort of fundamental change over the short term. The, the market share of the West Coast ports in LA, Long Beach in particular, has been declining on a secular basis for at least a dozen years, oh, maybe 15 so years, maybe, maybe 15 years. And there are a number of reasons for that. But, uh, you know, one of the reasons is, and, and this is certainly uh, something which is beyond the control of the ports and beyond the control of the state, is uh, competition. And particularly competition amongst the shipping lines, which is fierce and okay. never seems to stop. They just can't stop okay. themselves. Uh, and uh, whereas people that are shipping through the ports of uh, LA and Long Beach uh, to get to the, uh, to the eastern markets have to mm -hmm. rely on the railways. And the railways are not competing in the same way. So over that period of time, you've seen that the, the, the real the shipping rates is stagnant or even going down. Right. And obviously, because they're going to the East Coast, it's much more of the shipping lines than, than the inland transportation, whereas the railway rates, uh, they just keep going up. So uh, you know, it's just sort of the fundamental structure of, of your, your, your market. So it is important to realize those things that you can control and which you can't control. Right. Right. But it is true that um, you know, one of the advantages of LA Long Beach for, for the traffic is uh, or can be uh, more rapid uh, transit times and reliability. Now, I'm not sure they're achieving that now. 
which is which is an issue. So you know, if they're, what they're looking at is is how they can respond to those things which are outside their control, right. is is to try and optimize those things which are inside their control. So it's very important to to focus on. Uh, maximizing the efficiency of the gateway here in, in terms of the, the marine terminal operations, in terms of the drayage operations, in terms of the handoffs to the railways, uh, and, and all of those things which are within local, well, they're not exactly within local control, but uh, could potentially be, be, uh, be made more efficient for, through local action. Well, that's one question is how, how you are very dependent on the transshipment centers, the ones that convert the, that put the containers on the long hauls, you know, whether it's Ontario or the rail shipping centers. If you don't bring them into the equation, is that, will that ultimately be a limiting factor? Well, I'm not sure. Uh, you know, uh, where I come from in the port of Vancouver, in fact, transshipment has going, been going down, not up. And there are market factors which, uh, which uh, I can't exactly say, what, I don't have the data to tell you what they are. In the Canadian perspective, I think in, in some part it's because of the, the way the railways price their intermodal services. Because, and, and in fact, in the US, it may be that there's more of an advantage for shippers to transload here. Yeah. Uh, uh, and then, so then they get a, a lower rate per cubic foot on the domestic containers that they send to Chicago instead of uh, sending them in a 40 foot container. Um, that trend uh, took place for a while in Vancouver, and now it's gone away. So mm -hmm. it's, there, there are these uh, commercial factors which, right. which determine this. Uh, you know, obviously, uh, the Alameda corridor fee may have some small impact on that decision because if you transship, you, you don't pay the Alameda corridor fee, but it's very small. And, I, I think uh, that I was talking about capacity and modernization of the transshipment. If well, you think about the whole, environmental impact of the whole chain until it departs California. The transshipment... Well, trans transshipment obviously requires a lot of resources. It requires a lot of industrial land. Uh, it, at this point, it requires a lot of truck trips out to the Inland Empire, which right. is not particularly uh, optimal from an environmental perspective. And, right. uh, you know, so, so there are limitations there. Um, I guess that was my next question, is if you really want to push the environmental bar higher in performance. You are You've getting got to... right to a question I'm about ready to ask. So just real quickly, summarizing some of the things that I heard all of you talking about just now. One is the external pressure external that we're factors. having. So for instance, there's a lot more exporting that's going to be happening through this port. We heard that at Pulse of the Port the other day, um, the plastics people and all the pellets that are coming in now from Texas and other places that are making their way through the Mini Land Bridge on our rail lines, at exporting out through our ports. Huge demand, um, it's ex expected to grow. So there's this balancing act of things that are happening in the market that we can't really anticipate, but as, as a planner, and me trying to anticipate what kind of infrastructure improvements are needed, um, I'm really curious as to what the industry is thinking as far as how much stuff is going to continue to move through this gateway, depending on which marine terminals are re willing to step up, make those investments to meet those regulations, how much cargo is going to continue to flow through these ports and what should we be planning for on the infrastructure side? From a gateway perspective, I, if you can attract more exports here, it's, it's, uh, it's an entirely positive development. Right. And the, 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 the terminals really don't need to make more investments. Um, if you can attract the cargo, um, you'll, you'll do well. The only thing is that, that there is a lot of competition for that, particularly from the Gulf ports who are very close to the ports of, uh, the points of production. Uh, with re reduced shipping rates because of the opening of the Panama Canal. Uh, and they have been investing heavily in transload facilities at those ports. Um, so it, it's, uh, to the extent you can capture that traffic, it's, a, it's an entirely a positive development, but it's a, it's a very competitive business. Have any of you heard from the BCOs or, or that aspect of the supply chain as to what their thoughts are? Are they looking to move some of their facilities outside of California? Are they 
not worried about it and maintaining those plans to continue to operate here or expand here? What's a BTO? BCO, oh, I'm sorry. I was, I was warned about that. <laughs> Beneficial cargo owner. So those are the targets and lows in Walmarts, um, the guys that own all of the, the stuff. Well, on the video, we heard that they're worried about costs and that they'll pass that on to the customer. Mm -hmm. Right. So you may have higher costs of goods here for the goods that come in here, higher than, say, in Texas. Mm -hmm. And that's something that we haven't really seen happen yet. Most of those costs um, throughout the other, you know, as, as regulations have been passed down, we've, we've seen those costs be passed on to the supply chain. So whether it's the trucking industry or the warehouse industry side of it, those costs have been absorbed and not, they haven't made it into the retail side. So us cus consumers, we haven't felt it yet. So I think we're all waiting to see, will that really happen? That's a good question. That's a question I don't think any of us have a crystal ball to answer. Um, well, I, I think that um, if, if we continue to see the economy expand, the reasonable, reasonable expectation would be that both uh, imports are going to increase and exports are going to increase. But there's no guarantees on that, so you gotta kind of uh, look at uh, various industry segments like you, you mentioned, plastics, petrochemical industry is going to be uh, much stronger and uh, much more viable on a global basis. Uh, so you, you got to kind of break it down by industry and what's going to happen. In manufacturing, we break it into durable goods and non-durable goods. Durable goods is the big heavy iron type of uh, equipment and those types of things. That's where most of our exports will come from, whereas uh, a lot of what we bring in uh, from an import standpoint would probably be more uh, non-durable goods and more consumer items from that. I know there was a comment about comment cards being able to come up here, but I haven't seen any yet. So are there any burning questions from the audience? There's, one. Oh, There's a couple. A So this is a question for Philip Davies and Judy Mitchell. Um, can anyone estimate how long it will take before the communities on the east demand the same clean air considerations that are being initiated in West Coast communities? I didn't hear it. Say it. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I need to speak into this. Um, how long do you think it'll take the east coast to catch up to what the West Coast communities are pushing? On emissions levels or what? Clean air. Clean air. Um, well, they're not there yet, and under this administration, uh, <laughs> we're not there yet. <laughs> but um, uh, as many of you know, uh, California has two air districts that are non-attainment, the only two in the United States. So uh, we, uh, we're right on the forefront of pushing these kinds of technologies to get to clean air and we have limited time to do it. Um, we have obligations to reduce the NOx emissions by 2023, and we have to reduce them by about 55, 45% by that date, yeah. and then another 55% by 2031. So remember, these are criteria pollutants. This isn't even greenhouse gas that we're dealing with here in the South Coast. And that's why California is kind of on the forefront of reaching for yeah, the so greenest right. equipment, zero emission uh, vehicles. Um, the East Coast, we have some partners on the East Coast. Uh, in the Northeast, there's a group of about 13 Northeast states who kind of follow our lead. And there are a couple of ports, the New Jersey port on the East Coast has some of the same concerns that we have. So they're kind of pushing that way also. but. Um, when we go to Washington to ask for help, I will tell you that most of the Washington uh, congressional members kind of just look the other way because that's our problem. 
uh, it's not a problem in their state or, or throughout the rest of the United States. So, uh, and it, as you probably also know, I think the rest of the United States isn't quite as concerned about greenhouse gases as we are here. We share our concern on greenhouse gases with a lot of the European countries, but we haven't seen that spread you know, to, the, to the rest of the United States. The Clean Power Plan uh, that was enacted under um, the Obama administration has been set aside under the Trump administration. So I would say East Coast is pretty far off from getting where, where we are and not even interested in, in getting there. Well, and, and at the port level, uh, I don't think that they have uh, uh, really the resolve to move forward with that. The Port of New York, New Jersey had a plan to move to 2007 emission standards, and they delayed it. And the same thing happened in uh, Seattle, Tacoma, where they had a plan which was supposed to take effect, I think, this month. Maybe it was last month. And half, half of the industry had invested in new trucks, and the other half hadn't. Uh, and so there was, there was a, a, a big issue because the ones who hadn't ingested said that it couldn't possibly be done, and the ones who had already bought them said, well, how can you allow these people to, to, to continue to use 15-year-old trucks and to compete against this? That's not been resolved. And I've heard that story many times. Uh, that, so, so, you know, the, the resolve amongst the port communities is not it's there. Not and, you know, for some of the other ports, say, in the southeast, they don't have no. the same level of concern about air emissions it's simply because the ambient standard, the ambient air is is not in non-attainment. Right. Uh, right. So it's um, California is a leader, sort of by necessity, I'd say. <laughs> yes. I mean, what's the alternative? I've thought. So what if we don't meet those standards in 2023 and 2031 with regulatory measures, with new technology? Uh, and it crossed my mind, well, it may be that you can drive only on Monday and Wednesday. Or trucks can only come in out of the port on limited schedules. I mean, that could be the, the, the worst outcome that I can think of, but what else do we do if we don't get to the, to the, get the new technology in place and lower those emissions so we can keep our economy vibrant? So, I mean, I don't know that anybody else has thought about that, but, you know, it sometimes keeps me awake well, I th I at night. What do best, we do if we don't yeah. get there? I think the best solution is to improve the emissions and come up with ways of lowering the cost through technology. Then everybody's a winner. Right. Well, and that's one thing the South Coast does. We put a lot of money into mm -hmm. piloting and demonstration projects mm -hmm. on the new technology. I mean, we. Last year, CARB and the South Coast District and some OEMs, a group got to, we put $40 million into testing new mm -hmm. trucks. Mm -hmm. We've got five BYD electric trucks out there. We've got uh, some um, combination hybrids that are maybe CNG and battery. So there's different things that we're looking at, but that's what, what one of the things that's happening on the streets that we're looking, where, where, can, where can we put the money to develop that new technology? Mm -hmm. And I think the other thing is really the, the stakeholders that, that vary just not the technology providers or the sponsors, but the end user. Again, I keep going back to the end user again. They have to step up and, you know, for example, visualize 10 trucks driving through the city of Carson and, you know, we're collecting data or we're actually interviewing people who are seeing these electric trucks or zero, near zero emission vehicles on the road. We need to go out and get input from them as to whether or not this is impacting their lives. And, those kinds of inputs and active engagement from, from the community will really uh, make social acceptance uh, stronger and, and make this investments from public agencies a lot more validated, right? So I think it's, it's got to grow from there. It's not just this year, this grant, two years later, that grant, and then you can't have islands, and it has to start at some point and then really concatenate and maybe evolve and scale, and then that's a model that people can point to and then replicate. So again, you know, going back to the East Coast, this, California's problems may not be their problems, but the solutions that we come up with here will definitely be a solution for them. So I think that's the approach we need to take. There are comment cards. There are comment cards that Elizabeth is handing out and pens. So if you have a question that you wanted to write down, 
please. We had some questions. Oh, we have a question on the floor over here. If you could hear me. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, I commend all this. Um, I worked on a port, and I have since I was 16. Um, so breathing this is, can be horrible. Um, I'm a little surprised. I thought when we put a timeline on this, the pressure would be for the technology, which I think will make it. Um, they'll figure something out. I mean, but what I'm not hearing is, is what's happening in Europe. Gentleman here, and I'm, I'm sorry, that was from uh, Chevron. Yeah. He, he, you have the answer, and, and, and he said it. It, it. It's not just here in California. It, it's a global thing that's happening. Um, it, it's no different than a cell phone. Microsoft, Apple, they competed so hard to have the o OS system at, at a certain time frame. The, thing, the same thing's gonna happen now. It, the question is, is why is no one talking about Europe or Rotterdam or what's happening over there? We're concentrating just on what's happening here. We're not looking outside the box. I'm not understanding that. Well, I think, I think one of the ways you have to look at the United States is arguably uh, it, has, it has a regional structure when it comes to their economies, their environmental viewpoints, their energy systems. It isn't really one uniform system. And so but that's not surprising. I mean, California is bigger than most countries in terms of its system. Texas' energy system is as big as Germany's. I mean, you know, these are, these are huge economies in and of themselves. And so I think it's the idea of a harmonized system uh, has always been a challenge for the United States in, in any of these areas from when it comes to a regulatory point of view. So uh, I think that you could expect to see then technologies, as they become viable, spread their way through the system, but the rates might be very different. It might be the penetration rate of this technology might be very different in uh, the southeast than it is in the northeast of California, for example, right? where they, because of the the social, economic, and political structures of those, those uh, regions. And the U.S. has been very hesitant to have a uniform policy on this. Even though the closest we've got to it is CAFE, right? And, and of course, California has the carve out under CAFE. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, not all the states have the same CAFE standard as, as... But there have been good success stories. For example, the California forcing the change in sulfur content of diesel fuel has now propagated across the whole globe almost. I mean, almost all the advanced countries now have low sulfur diesel as standard. So that's an example. Of course, substituting fuel is the, one of the easiest of substitutions as opposed to changing the whole basis right. of the technologies. But, but that's a... That's an example of things propagating, but they don't, it didn't happen overnight either. So I, I think that there isn't one time scale for the transformation, I think is maybe a way to think about that. And I'm, and I'm sure the automakers recognize that that's, that's what happens, mm -hmm. right? I mean, mm -hmm. look at electric vehicles, a perfect example. California has 50% of all of the ones in the United States, okay? And, and the and other so, thing... And you would expect then for it to continue to be at a, at a forefront position in these technologies. But the diffusion rate across the other states is very low. Little, pot, little pieces here and there, but... Not to belabor this point, the one thing that I would like to add is it's not like you introduce a technology and it just solves world hunger, right? So you gotta look at the operation, you gotta look at the segments, and you gotta see where the technology introduction actually is meaningful. And, and, where it's, where it's feasible, the most useful. Where it can, yeah, yeah, so that's kind of the mindset, and I think everybody's kind of looking at it together. Right. We don't have the European Union structure, which makes it a that's little right. harder to, to sort of harmonize the, and, and standardize the technologies. One more question, and, and on that note then, because you just answered my question. He's been mentioning Texas. I, I, I work here, but I live in Texas. Yeah, you're right. The Texans, they could, I mean, they don't have the same mind frame we do at this point. 
it's completely different. Um, if you mentioned um, not having trucks on the road, you know, Monday and Wednesdays, they, the customer is going to want their cargo. They'll take it in Texas, whether there's emissions or not. Right. And I think the gentleman from Chevron could I'd probably back that up on me because he keeps mentioning Texas over and over and <laughs> over again. I mean, every other bumper sticker is frack this, frack that. It, well, it, it, really, I mean, let's be honest with each other. It, it, it's a different, it, the, the, are we willing, that's my question, I guess, is are we willing to, to not meet a deadline and say, okay, the port might die. I have a couple of cards I'm gonna, I'm, we're going to alternate between the cards and people, um, questions in the audience. So this is one real quickly that I think Aravon can put to bed is, when will we see trucks operating on an overhead catenary system? Boy. Uh, <laughs> well, again, I'll, I'll draw on this example, right? You have the catenary system. So the people who ask the question, you know, what does it take to operate that? You need the truck that can connect to the catenary and then you need the catenary that can connect to the truck, any truck, over several miles to make this viable, sustainable, and then there's the business model in question. How are we gonna pay for this? How are we gonna maintain this? Right. It's an electromechanical piece of equipment that needs to be updated periodically, so I can go on and on, but the question really is long-term sustainability of this whole system of systems. How are we gonna plan that? So it's not the responsibility of one automotive OEM. We can put the truck out there, but if it's really not having the catenaries to connect to, no con go. customer is gonna really buy it because it's gonna run out of juice, uh, depending on the operation. So again, I think ask, answering these kinds of questions really is, uh, I think it's the effort of a team that is looking to deploy these systems and scale it. And uh, well, of course, South Coast contributed quite a lot of money to yes, the catenary yes. program. And um, it was um, at one time uh, conceived as a possibility mm -hmm. for the I-710 corridor. Mm -hmm. uh, Bonnie Lowenthal, I think, is here. Mm -hmm. And she sat on the project committee for I-710, as I did. And um, the costs just to do the expansion of the right. I-710 were so expensive, I don't think seven billion or something under the 5C plan. If you went to the dedicated freight corridor where you could have done a catenary, that doubled the cost. Yeah. And the other thing that we looked at was, well, now we're getting newer technology in clean engines, so maybe you don't need an overhead catenary wire mm -hmm. for that. It would have been still mm -hmm. useful because you'd, you'd, your, your battery will charge up while you're on the catenary. Mm -hmm. What, uh, and, I, and I visited the catenary. The, the original catenary is a Siemens project, and it was done on an airfield uh, in um, East Germany, a, a Russian airfield that was abandoned. And, um, it was pretty interesting because you could watch the trucks. We had two trucks came down the catenary and one could pull off, going 60 miles an hour or so. One could pull off and pass the other one and then get back on the catenary. So it was very flexible. And the, and the beauty of that was the truck could pull off at any exit on the 710 or whatever freeway or where you put it and, and you know, have the flexibility of different off, off, off points. But the cost is going to be prohibitive to do it on the 710. Germany is, is using that system in a couple of places where it is a short run, multiple trucks back and forth, back and forth on the same run. Uh, one was a four mile stretch and one was a 10 mile stretch. Ten mile you stretch, probably right, right, are right. familiar with that. And it makes sense in some uh, instances, but you'd have to plan exactly where that would go and, and then it could be pretty useful. I mean, there might be some useful place for it in the port where you have the same run back and forth. So the other problem we ran into with the catenary that we did here on Alameda was that underneath Alameda Street are all kinds of pipelines. Right. Electric lines, Edison Gas lines, lines. Um, oil lines. pipelines. So when we went to put the poles in, for the uh, to string up the wire for the catenary, 
it was, where we wanted to put it was really hard. We had to devise some new ways to put those pillars in so we weren't dug digging down underneath the, the street where all these pipelines were. So that was another thing. Where can you put it? You know, you know, in the city, in an urban environment, you may find all kinds of things under the street that are going to be an impediment. And then your costs go up incredibly, too. Mm -hmm. That was the mm -hmm. other thing we ran into. And, and I think one other, one other challenge with overhead catenary is it's permanent. So you're, you're putting a huge amount of investment in infrastructure, and the facilities that they're trying to go to might change. So um, that permanence, whereas some of the new technologies <clears throat> with electric trucks, you still have that flexibility of a truck without the major investment and the permanence of, of infrastructure like that. So we have quite a few other questions. Sasha, I know you had one that you wanted to ask. Okay, I wasn't prepared really, but uh, let me just say, I've been an ILW member for the last two years, casual for four, since 14 years ago, 2004. But uh, prior to that, I've been a Green Party member, Green Party of California, since 1992. And prior to that, I was a Green Movement activist since 89. And I was a grassroots activist since I was 17 years old in 1977. And so I just want to say that from a blue collar worker perspective, the things that I've seen and also from the perspective of being an environmentalist and an activist, I, I'm grateful for all of the things that are happening to create a sustainable system here on the ground. But I also see that if, and I agree with the statement I heard earlier where if we converted to electricity tomorrow, we don't have the local production of readily available e electricity to convert everything. So I, I can also say that um, we're kind of putting the cart before the horse, literally, saying let's build all this electrical vehicle demand without actually having a supply that's sustainable. Even if we could draw all of the electricity from solar farms in the desert, approximately 50% of, of electricity produced and transmitted across transmission lines is lost in the transmission. So what we really need to see is the fact that we have thousands of acres of terminals and parking lots and building rooftops and railway right-of-ways and freeway right-of-ways where there's open sky above and there are zero solar panels, with the exception of LB24. But the only fact, the only reason I believe that LB24 has solar is because it was built into the budget, but they automated and killed probably 80% of the jobs on that terminal. Well, the question is, <laughs> can we? <laughs> it the grandstand or anything, but I just wanted to lay, lay it in perspective. Uh, can we utilize what we have in terms of square footage, of, of square mileage of space to create electricity with solar right here. The cost of solar panels is below 50 cents a watt now, and it's gonna probably drop, continue dropping below 25 cents a watt within the next few, uh, the next few weeks, or I'm sorry, the next few years. So, and it's- I think that's for you, Don. That's, well, I'm sorry for the long <laughs> question. I, 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 would just, I would just say, I think you raised, you raised a, tremendous, a tremendously important Point, and that is if you're going to fundamentally convert the energy source for the operation of the port, it really makes a lot of sense to have thought about the energy, integrated energy plan around it. One cannot just assume that you're going to be able to tap into the larger uh, grid necessarily. I mean, you will need some interaction. But I think that an integrated energy, and that would be a question I would ask, as I didn't hear much about that, but. Why wouldn't that be part of the overall plan for the electrification of the transport system would be an energy system which could clearly use 
Um, you can think of a lot of ways to do it, but one of them would be to use the space as support for, for solar. And there are lots and lots of flat roofs when you fly into LAX, and you wonder why aren't there any solar panels on these? So, I mean, there, there's some opportunities there. We, we need a utility up here is basically. Well, we, that was what the next thing I was going to say. The utility really be, ought to be part of the discussion. Yeah, it, it's really an important part of the discussion because when we're talking about going all electric, you need, your, you need to know where that electricity is going to come from, right. how they're going to yep. plan it, and what, what, how the grid will be ready for it. So I will say that uh, in the South Coast District, um, I um, formed a little working group uh, with Edison to talk about these issues uh, and is the grid ready. And so we meet with them every couple of months and talk about mm -hmm. what they're doing. and. And, uh, and uh, they were very instrumental in planning out the catenary. Can we put a catenary down 710? How do we do it? Where's the energy going to come from? How many substations do we have to put in? So it's really important that they're part of this discussion. And I don't know if the ports are, are dealing with two different utilities, LA Department of Water and Power, Power. and then uh, Edison on, on the Long Beach side. On the other side, yeah. So, you know, it would be a good idea to get them together, too, the two utilities, to talk about what, what's happening. And, and right. they have, I mean, at least conversations that we've had with them in the past. SCE and DW, or LADWP have been working with the port so closely on cold ironing and, um, or short of ship power, depending on which port you're in. And all of those other, um, you know, Middle Harbor wouldn't have been powered without SCE's cooperation and getting the power down to power right. that huge terminal. So. There is a lot of coordination going on, and it's really awesome to see. Really important. Right. Actually, that raises a point because, um, you know, I hear a lot about the Middle Harbor project, and I hear people tell me that the technology doesn't exist to electrify the terminals. So it seems to me, you know, is, is Middle Harbor the solution? Is it going to leapfrog all of the conventional terminals to provide the solution? And if that case, if that's the case, is the technology there, but it's just too expensive. Mm -hmm. Interesting about Middle Harbor is they use the lead acid battery. They're now using lithium batteries. Mm -hmm. uh, they're using lead acid. Right. And uh, so that's, that, I was kind of shocked when I visited there and found out this is what, what they're doing. So I mean, you can, you can do it with the lead acid battery. What, what they did is quite an accomplishment. We don't want to use those in our, our trucks, but no, we hope to get to the lithium ion in for motor vehicles, mm -hmm. but they were using those in their, um, what they call those little um, automated... Uh, the AVGs, automated, what called? Oh, yeah, automated local, guided vehicles. The little vehicles. run vehicles, AGVs. yeah. AGVs. Yeah. Whatever, well, those little automated things that guided the containers vehicles. around. Yeah, well, automated as they say, I mean, uh, automated terminals are much more common in Europe, as they say, and they have implemented the, and, and they've done one on the East Coast. Um, now, Having said that, an automated terminal brings up the prospect of many more very significant adjustments to the way port operations are run here. Right. Right. Yeah, so I, I, have a, I only have time to ask you all two more questions. Um, this one was a little bit of a zinger, so I don't know if I want to go here, but... <laughs> oh, what the heck. I'm used to it. <laughs> The recent CARB presentation showed that residual risks from trucks and car cargo handling equipment, or CHE, is insignificant, <laughs> yet the CAP proposes costs of billions to further reduce this insignificant risk. Why is the focus on electrification when other renewable technologies are available at a fraction of the cost? Don't all answer at once. <laughs> <laughs> this is the cap plan, right? Right, so it, it is. You're asking why the cap is relying on electricity when there's other, other kinds of technologies. Well, and, electricity and I, is you know. uh, zero emission. Um, I think I'll speak to one part of that, and that is that we don't, we're not, we don't have the technology right now for zero emission heavy duty trucks. What we do have the technology for now is the low NOx truck, which is reduces the NOx yeah. by about 99%. I mean, it gets it down to almost nothing. And that truck is certified. And 
is going to be marketed, I think, mm -hmm. in the next month or so. Mm -hmm. So I, from the South Coast perspective, that's the interim measure. That's the interme intermediate that will go to low NOx dredge trucks right now. Mm -hmm. And as battery technology gets perfected, then we will look to electrifying and going to better battery electric. Now there are a number of trucks out there that maybe can meet our, meet our um, you're probably going to chime in on this, but um, hybrid kinds of trucks that could meet the uh, duty cycle and demand of, of the dredge truck. Yeah. Again, you know, I just don't want to cherry pick a technology and say that's going to be the winner, it'll solve world hunger, whatever. <laughs> I think it's really understanding how the operations work and introducing the technologies. I've said this before, I'm repeating myself, I know, but think about this, right? The trucks are at the ports and they're spending a lot of time waiting, idling. That's an operation which pollutes the environment that can be made cleaner, for example. Uh, there's the uh, regions, uh, uh, just the gateway cities where the trucks are driving. That's a region, maybe certain times of the day, the pollution is probably gonna pick up. It's gonna be at its peak. That's a time, uh, that's a temporal situation where you can inject some clever, uh, you know, connectivity-based technologies, for example, to talk to the diesel trucks or the, the hybrid trucks or alternative fuel trucks to, to sort of drive at a slower speed or to choose a different route. You see where I'm going with this? So you start, off, you start looking at the system and see how the system is reacting at different times of the day, different days of the week, and then you inject these technologies. It's not that you're, you're gonna need all things electric, all things near zero to achieve your goal. It's really a matter of the different silos sort of really talking to one another and seeing how cleverly can we, can, can we actually use what we have right now, the existing infrastructure, to sort of make progress and then just sort of tactfully inject the right kind of technologies that meet the demands of the operation. Is that abstract enough? And if I could, if I could say that your, your example is perfect because you have the example of all the trucks that are idling in front of the port that could use cleaner technology, the best solution is to stop them stop idling, idling in front of the port. Exactly. And right. that, that has been done elsewhere yeah, right. effectively. That's and it's right. not an impossible thing to do. Exactly. And it doesn't require new technology. No. <laughs> well, and that is part of the <laughs> And that the is last... part of the cap. It, they yeah, have system yeah. efficiencies is in there. It's just not quite sure how we're gonna, how they're going to do and it. I, I, I think people here. get lost because system efficiencies really sh I think that should be at the at the at heart the of every discussion. Right. Yeah, yeah. Not a per truck kind of thing. And then my very last question, and this is just because I haven't heard Norbert say much tonight, so <laughs> not to pick on you, but cool having the Atlanta and the Vancouver persons on our panel, I'd like to hear what are you hearing, what kind of rumblings are you hearing back in your homes as to, you know, is California crazy? Or is it something that you think <laughs> will spread? Well, the first question I don't have an answer for. <laughs> <laughs> Very politically um, correct. No, the thing that really jumped out at me was uh, talking about the competition from the ports. And I live in Atlanta, and so I've, I've got familiarity with Jacksonville, Savannah, Charleston, Wilmington, and Newport News. Uh, and I can tell you those ports are so competitive among themselves, mm -hmm. and there would be a rush to new equipment if it was more efficient in particular. Uh, but they, they, will, they will gradually keep up. Uh, when I look at the port here, and uh, uh, those ports on the East Coast don't even begin to rival what comes right. through here size-wise and so on. So their perception of the problems and everything are, are dramatically different, I, I believe. Interesting. I also would add that I had a discussion last week, just this past week, with a company that uh, is patenting a process to make a lithium ion battery 30% more, more, more uh, longevity. And that's not what we need, we need 300%. <laughs> but it's getting there. <laughs> but 30 is a start, and that's what I expect to see continue to happen. Thank you. From the Vancouver perspective, no, they're not laughing at the ports of California, but the, but the port of Vancouver has adopted a goal of being the most sustainable port. So, uh, you know, they, um, 
they, they, they're rising to the challenge. They're probably going to do it with technology developed in California, however. Right. So, so maybe we can learn some lessons from Vancouver. That was my thought. Well, some. thank you. I'd like to thank our panel for spending all this time. And and thank you all very much for coming tonight. to buy electric cars about a year ago because they had a fabulous incentive program. Mm -hmm. So at this point, I'd like to invite our, our panelists to return to their seats and, and as is our custom, uh, invite uh, Dr. Jen Giuliano to come up and tell us what we heard and what we learned. Um. I get the almost last word. Can you hear me? Yes, I just heard another comment about my shortness. <laughs> I'm telling you. OK, um, I'm going to um, not exactly tell you what you heard. Uh, I'm going to give you my interpretation of some of the major points that I heard. Um, and I'm going to sort of embellish them a little bit with some of my own thoughts. Um, if there was one theme um, of this um, town hall, I have to say it is about uh, technology development and the speed thereof. Um, there was tremendous uncertainty that was expressed about whether or not um, the science can actually move fast enough to um, achieve the California targets, uh, which actually are legislated, by the way, uh, for 2030, never mind 2050. Um, I kind of share that view. Uh, I often say, you know, it's 2018 here, um, and we do not have a fleet of those trucks even in production. Uh, and it takes a really long time to turn over fleets. So uh, even from the time period aspect, I think uh, there are some questions to be asked. Um, nevertheless, um, there is a very rapid and a lot of investment, at least in California, going on to try to move the technology. Um, there's a tremendous amount of experimentation um, you heard about the uh, five trucks. Um, this summer, late this summer, late 2018, there's going to be 43 different types of alternative fuel vehicles being tested by the Air District, most of them in, in drayage operation. Um, so there's a great effort um, going on. Those new trucks, by the way, will have a range of approximately 100 miles. Um, so that's where we are uh, in 2018, late starting a demonstration program. Um, now I want to sort of talk uh, about um, technology change and some of the things that I heard about technology change. Um, one of the things that I thought was a really good point that just got talked about a bit, not very much, is what are the indirect effects of technology change? Um, on different sectors uh, within the supply chain and uh, on different population groups. Um, some of these changes are actually very large changes. Um, if we went to a, a totally different fleet um, within a short period of time, um, then the people who maintain diesel trucks are kind of out of uh, work, never mind uh, a lot of other things. So. Um, and we need to train a whole other uh, group to be able to maintain this new technology. And we'd have to have all the infrastructure that goes with it. Um, so it's actually a really big push, and I've not actually seen a lot of planning and a lot of analysis for these types of indirect effects. Um, <clears throat> another point um, that came up in various ways was who pays? directly or indirectly. Um, there's a lot of talk about that seven to $14 billion and where will it come from? Uh, and that's part of the question, but the other part of the question is ultimately, where does it land? 
Um, if it's all public land, uh, public money, it lands in your respective pocketbooks in the form of taxes. Um, if it lands uh, on, let's say, beneficial cargo owners, um, if they are in a sufficiently healthy position, uh, they <clears throat> can pass costs on. Uh, if competition is really rough, they cannot. Um, so it's not a question of will they or won't they, it's can they or can they not. Uh, and so that's going to be the question, uh, no matter where these costs lie. Ultimately, uh, my economist friends always tell me uh, that all new costs either land up in, end up in land or labor. Uh, so either the rents go up or your prices go up. <clears throat> so I, again, I don't think there's been a lot of thought here about what those kinds of impacts are, kind of um, thinking them through. Uh, the third point is um, the high price of being a leader. Um, we are out way, way in front, and that means that we get to make all the mistakes. Uh, we get to try all the new technologies and decide which ones work and which ones don't work. Um, you heard the story of the catenary. Um, there are going to be, there's, there's just one technology after another that's going to be the technology that works. Um, and uh, it's, again, it's expensive uh, to be the first. And there's no question that when, as um, Phil Davies said, when Vancouver gets around to doing this, or when Savannah gets around to doing this, um, there will be a much more mature technology for them to do it with. Uh, and so I think, um, again, as from a public policy perspective, we kind of have to take that into account. Um, the fourth point that I have to make is that, um, gee, I wish we did more benefit cost analysis um, in terms of um, determining our public policies. Um, <laughs> because it's absolutely true that um, when we're going from, um, well, we, we really do need to weigh the costs against the benefits of doing things. Uh, and Judy Mitchell brought this up in a very genteel kind of way uh, because she said, you know, um, we have changed things before and if we can't do it, we will change things again. And we um, have, uh, we must consider the economy. And really what she was saying is that we have to weigh the benefits against the costs. And if we do that, then um, we know that that last increment of eliminating whatever it is you want to eliminate, whether it's NOx or whether it's the last amount of CO2, is always extremely expensive and doesn't get you much in the way of benefits. So another thing I think we ought to be thinking about is what's kind of the appropriate level and what's the appropriate target um, given the benefits that can be generated. Um, and I see Tom staring at me, um, which means <laughs> that my time is up. We have great communication just looking at each other these days. Um, so <laughs> so um, my final point is about um, something that was brought up again, um, mostly by Don Paul. Um, and that's, we're talking about markets of actually very large scale and systems of very large scale. Um, and so when, um, when we think about making a change, we really do have to think about this in the context of uh, a very large and complicated market with many kind of subsystems along with it. Uh, <clears throat> and I think if we did that again, uh, we could come up with um, more effective public policies. So I'm done, thank you. <laughs> I've had two, two great mentors in my academic and, and professional life, and so to be, to be able to actually give Jen a look to get her off the stage is, is, is a major significant accomplishment for me. Yeah. Um, and in transition to the other person who was a, uh, my, my principal mentor, uh, that's Marianne uh, Gastelum. And I'm really pleased to close the evening tonight 
um, with uh, the presentation of the, the second annual Dominic Moretti Award. Um, I, want to, I do want to thank uh, our panel, uh, Jolene, Phil, Judy, Norbert, Donald, uh, Arvin, and, and Jen for the wrap up. Um, it really, if, if you look at the, pro at the program and their backgrounds, this was an expert panel, a lot of intellectual capacity on the stage, and I'm, I'm thrilled that we were able to bring it um, to you. Um, and it truly was informative and in the spirit of education. And education is what the late Dominic Moretti, an original member of the CITT Policy and Steering Committee, uh, meant when he said he wanted to bring the university to the docks and the docks to the university. Dominic was instrumental in the development of the town hall and making sure that the ILWU was at the table from the beginning. Um, he was something of a waterfront renaissance man. Uh, he was a proud longshoreman and a proud graduate with his bachelor's and master's degree from the beach. Um, he also received his PhD from UCLA. He split his days on the docks, first as a member of Local 13 and then as a shipping clerk for Local 63, with time spent in the classroom as a teacher at Dodson Junior High, and as Dr. Moretti, a professor at East Los Angeles College where he helped to establish the international trade program. He was passionate about education, understanding that there was something new to learn about this industry no matter how long you had worked in it or lived in its shadow. Last year, the Moretti Award was created in his memory to recognize someone who has helped to foster partnerships along the supply chain, facilitate dialogue, and demonstrate long-term dedication to the industry, and someone who has earned the respect of a wide variety of stakeholders. Um, Norman Fassler Katz uh, was our first recipient last year uh, as the senior consultant to the Senate Select Committee on California Ports and Goods Movement. Um, he knew both Dominic and is a good friend of Mary Ann's, and we thought it was, a, uh, I, it was an ideal opportunity to have him return to present the award to Mary Ann tonight. So please help me welcome Norman Fassler Katz. Thank you, Tom. Um, the first thing I want to tell you is that tonight you're going to witness the first of a new concept of distributing awards. Because um, I'm giving it to Mary Ann, and tonight I'm announcing that I will be the next year's winner, and Mary Ann will present it to me. <laughs> we don't have to change our remarks. And we can save a lot of money. So what could be bad about that? Seriously, I, um, some of you know I seldom write remarks. But uh, tonight I was driven by the desire to ensure that I miss absolutely nothing in describing our friend and colleague. Dominic Moretti was the penultimate believer in breaking down siloed walls between stakeholders in the world of international trade and transportation. Now, as an aside, I want to tell you something. That I had a friend of mine who's an, a, a, a grammarian, a grammarian, grammarian, I guess it is, and um, I, he looked over my speech, and he told me a story about the word penultimate. I believed all these years of my life that penultimate meant the best, but it doesn't. It means the second best. <laughs> so I am admitting my mistake, and I am saying the ultimate, not penultimate. What a lesson this was for me. In particular, though, Dom aspired to develop a mechanism to create a common table of interest with the longshoremen and the above-mentioned stakeholders. In Marianne, he found a kindred spirit with an energy to match. She spoke Dom's language. Together, they grasped the importance of all parties in the complex maritime transportation system coming together for honest, and yes, sometimes difficult dialogue. 
Neither Dom nor Marianne approached this monumental journey with any ego of their own investment, but rather wanting to serve as role model leaders to the various components of our work. Marianne worked to create an atmosphere of mutual respect while casting a huge tent of inclusion made up of not only industry leaders, but acad academia as well as public policymakers. Marianne truly loved the entirety of the work she did and does. That passion enabled her to grow the Center for International Trade and Transportation at Cal State Long Beach into a source of expertise known throughout the country. Dom's vision was being acted upon every day. Mary Ann, through her persistence and absolute belief in the value attributed to the multiple pronged goods movement industry and the resultant challenges being faced in the Southern California basin, possessed the vision to see merit in helping to raise the consciousness of Southern California consumers. I, as an aside, I wanted to make a comment about what uh, Fran Inman said in the uh, video. Um, and then Mary Ann and I sort of chuckled and leaned toward each other. She talked about how uh, this was a siloed environment, a siloed industry. And while we today may still consider it to be siloed, I wish you could, I wish we all could remember and have the perspective of history to show how far we've come over the last many years. Mary Ann established a research center devoted to fostering skilled and well-trained trade and transportation professionals. Her success in working together with Tom O'Brien was a significant achievement. Her stepping away was seamless by Tom's moving up to, into his current position. I won't repeat the story Mary Ann told you last year. You'll hear it again next year anyway. As she... <laughs> as she recalled our first meeting from her perspective. Now mine. Can you just imagine how I felt in listening to our exchanges and realizing that she didn't think I was crazy? You can't have worked with someone like her for more than 20 years without treasuring her caring and yes, loving self. She is unique in offering her qualities to those who are connected in all facets of her life. Those of us who are blessed to know her, work with her, share our lives with her, know the special nature of her empathy and have benefited from her many kindnesses. Marianne is the real deal. Within the walls of her work or in her life as a friend, confidant and fun-loving spirit, we recognize the extraordinary gifts she gives both professionally and personally. Her driving leadership proved that this was much more than a job. Her legacy will be the valued work of her creation, continuing to thrive and grow in impact. I can't begin to tell you how honored I am to be able to present you, Mary Ann, with the 2018 Dominic Moretti Award. Very heavy. Yeah. Well, sir.
That was very nice. Dave, did you get that? Dave Kelly, who is filming. <laughs> well, good evening, everybody. Let me adjust the microphone. And thank you for staying now 10 minutes after 8. It, it almost kills me to have this to do to you. Um, but I want to tell you that um, I will never forget the time and the day when I met Dominic Moretti. Nor will I forget having met Norman Fassler Katz. For those of you who were here last year, I told you that Norm, meeting Norm was a moving experience because Norm likes to move around during meetings. Well, not so Dominic, uh, I mean walking around, but moving in the sense of his presence and his grace. Call me prejudice, but I expected a, a brownie, rough longshore, uh, someone fitting for the work down at the dock when I met Dominic, but the man who came to my office back in 1997 was a slender, yet tall man, soft-spoken, and as you heard earlier, highly educated gentleman. He was most eloquent and encouraged me and encouraged my plan to make longshore labor part of the newly formed Policy and Steering Committee at CITT, a group in the center that was committed to bring together more collaboration between industry, education, and community. Actively engaging the ILWU was the goal of our first town hall meeting back in 1990. Do we have a poster there? You see the poster on the wall. We named it, therefore, the first annual ILWU State of the Trade and Transportation Industry Town Hall Meeting, and the theme was Global Connectivity, Collective Responsibility for Future Growth, Economic Well-Being, and Job Security at the ports of LA and Long Beach. Attendance was expected to be very low. Many on our committee could not envision that Longshore would come to the campus after work in the evening. Well, over 2,000 ILWU members showed up. <laughs> and they filled every seat of the Carpenter Performing Arts Center, and there was overflow in the foyer, and we had a tiny little TV camera that streamed the proceedings. I'm looking at Patty Senecal, who was involved in that effort, and Patty had at that time uh, the onerous task to go out and ask the industry for, town, uh, for, for door prices for every evaluation that is filled out. And she has stories to tell about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, up to this day, I still don't know how Dominic did it. Um, this has never happened before. And the response from the community, from the industry, and from the press locally and nationally was remarkable. I had to go back to my folders and check out some of the press that I saved. And I picked out an article uh, that was written on the event by Traffic World. And the title of the article was Quiet Before the Storm. Now you should know that 1999 was a new contract negotiation year. So those in the industry know that there is not exactly quiet in the West, right? So the article goes like this. Uh, it is too bad that Madeleine Albright wasn't able to attend the first ever ILWU town hall meeting. The secretary would have been proud indeed. The three-hour event drew over 1,300 longshore and industry, and no one even mentioned the upcoming negotiations between the ILWU and the PMA. Now, that's diplomacy. That's what the article says. So I'll write for you young folks. She was Secretary of State under Clinton at that time. Well, you must know, and you heard it tonight, that back then, this was the most fragmented and siloed industry in the United States. And I totally agree with, with uh, Norm. Much, we have come a long way. Much has changed since then. And there's still operation necessary. For Dominic, the operative word was collaboration. He believed that the only way for the industry to move forward is if they work together. He has and he was and he is a unifying legacy. Dominic and I love this industry, the potential of the economic benefits it brings to the region, to the state, and to our nation, 
has been our passion. I'm very grateful, very grateful indeed, and proud of Tom O'Brien and his team for not only continuing the good work of CITT, but taking it to the next level. I'm grateful to Metrans, I'm grateful to CITT, uh, to, to CSULB, and I'm grateful to our dean, to our college, for giving me the opportunity to follow my passion. I want to thank the Policy and Steering Committee for voting for me and doing it again next year for Norm. <laughs> um, and finally, I, I am so blessed with wonderful friends who joined me here tonight for the occasion. Sitting to two hour talk is not easy. That's dedication. And I want to thank you for that. And I want to thank you for your friendship. You know who you are. I will not list the name because that's a slippery road. You forget someone in the words. <laughs> my husband, Juan Gastelum, who came into my life just before retirement. And I would say that he was a key stimulus for retirement. Yet he is very supportive of my continuous engagement. And I appreciate that. Big thank you to you, Norm, for coming all the way down from Sacramento to introduce the award. I very much appreciate it. Let me conclude by saying that I'm so proud and so honored to receive the Dominic Moretti Award in the mem memory of a phenomenal human being. Thank you all for staying. <laughs> Have you done this yeah. Yeah. No. Oh, stay, 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 stay. At this point, I'd like to ask uh, three of Dominic's brethren, uh, Mike Ponce, Gary Herrera, and Rudy Alba Sr., representing the three locals, to come to the podium for a, a photo uh, for a photo opportunity. If you could. Right here. Yeah. Norm? Mary Ann, congratulations. Thank you. Uh, thank you to our entire panel of distinguished guests Oops. Uh, for your expertise and contributions. Um, as we conclude tonight's program, a couple of reminders. Um, tonight's proceedings will be captured in a summary report available on our website. If you wish a copy of the video, uh, we encourage you to go to the CITT website within the next month or so. Um, for, uh, for a copy that you can download. Thank you again to Dave Kelly and the AMP team for putting it all together. Um, once again, we owe a great deal of gratitude to many, many people whose dedicated time and effort and money make this happen. Um, thank you first to Alex Traver and, and my team at CITT, um, her amazing support staff, including Royce de Rivera, Kylie Shahar, Marissa Eide, um, all of our research assistants who serve under the direction of Tyler Reeb. We have an amazing team. Um, in the best, in the best of, uh, of logistics operations, we're lean but effective. Um, and so I, I, appreciate their, I appreciate their efforts. It's been a long day starting with the Congress, so um, they're ready for a holiday tomorrow. I want to mention again, today's event is hosted by CITT, the College of Continuing and Professional Education under the leadership of Dean G. Joshi and the Metrans Transportation Center with financial contributions by our town hall sponsors, um, the Metrans core sponsors, and our associates. Um, and to you, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming tonight, for staying through it, 
Um, I think it was a very informative discussion. I hope you found the information of value, and we hope to see you again at next year's event. So we stand adjourned. Thank you. And good night. Yeah.